And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is David Icke, world-famous author, researcher, and public speaker for his work exposing today's fast-unfolding global dystopia more than three decades before it came reality. He has written over 20 books and spoken in over 25 countries, and today we will be talking about the simulation and the mind trap. David, thank you so much for being my guest, and welcome. Thanks, Jeff. It's a real pleasure, because I, I watch your show a lot. It's um, it's a source of fascinating information. Well, I'm almost speechless to hear you say that, so thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. And I think the best way to start is... Did you personally have some sort of spiritually transformative experience that made you aware of the simulation? Well, I had a, a, a transformative experience. Uh, and what I have, have had, and I think this is what awakening is, um, awakening from previous perceptions and programming, is it's a series of awakenings. So you, you awaken to a certain level and you, you see, for instance, um, in the early 1990s, I could see that the people who were apparently running the world, presidents and prime ministers, weren't actually doing it. There was a, 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 a in the shadows is where it was coming from. And they were working through both parties. And we lived in one party states. I saw all that. And I started putting that together. But then you have another awakening. Then you have another one and another one. And, and with each one, you, you expand your appreciation of the scale of what's going on. So the initial awakening um, really started, I guess, consciously in 1980, 80, like the late 1980s. And um, I was a, a national spokesman at the time for the British Green Party, and I was a presenter uh, with the BBC uh, News and um, overwhelmingly sport presenter and i started to have this feeling in what it would have been early 1989 that when i was in a room alone i wasn't alone it, there was a presence there and and i wasn't into any of this stuff at the time but it was it was tangible and through 1989 it became more and more powerful and tangible until I found myself in a, a hotel room, the Kensington Hilton Hotel, just down the road from the BBC. And I'd come back from doing a program and I sat on the side of the bed and this presence was so tangible. It was, it was blatant. And um, I said out into the room, I was on my own, obviously, uh, if there's something there, would you please contact me? Cause you're driving me up the wall. Um, and then I got on with my life. But a few days later, I'm, um, I'm with my son, Gareth, big strapping uh, guy now, uh, working for Iconic with me, but um, then a little boy. And uh, we were going to have some, uh, some lunch at, a, at a, a cafe on the seafront at Ride, uh, where I live on the Isle of Wight in England. And this railway worker came up to me because there was a railway station there and started talking to me about football. Uh, and because I presented football and sport on the BBC. And then when that had finished, I realized that Gareth was was not there. And he, he, I knew where he would be. He would be in the um, in the, the little newsagent shop uh, on the seafront uh, reading steam train books because we like steam trains. Um, and uh, I, I walked in and there he is with a steam train book in his hand. And suddenly the atmosphere changed. Uh, I had no idea, obviously, what was going on. Now I, I realized there was an electromagnetic field change going on. And uh, my feet started to kind of pull towards the ground like they were being pulled by magnets. And the, this, this atmospheric change uh, happened uh, very quickly. And I heard it wasn't a voice but it was like a very strong thought form. And it said, go and look at the books on the far side. And I knew this newsagent shop went in there all the time. And the books on the far side were 
romantic novels, not my scene at all. You know, Mills and Boone, as they were called in those in this country, and, and Barbara Cartland and all those things, romantic novels. And I, but but because of what was happening to me, I kind of walked uh, towards them um, in a daze, thinking, what the heck's going on here? And in among the uh, Mills and Boone and the Barbara Cartland was this one book, and it was called Mind to Mind, and it was by a psychic called Betty Shine. It was basically her autobiography. So I picked it up because it was different to the rest, and I turned it over and read the blurb, and I saw the word psychic. And I'd never, you know, been involved in this area at all before. But um, I, my immediate reaction was, I wonder if this lady would pick up what the heck's been happening to me for the last year. This was in March 1990 that, that this happened. So I read the book in 24 hours and then contacted her and went to see her. And what I said to her, uh, Jeff, is that, you know, I've got rheumatoid arthritis, you know, I finished my football career, my professional football career. Um, and maybe your hands-on healing, exchange of energy might, might help because that's what she did as well. And because I didn't want to give her any preconceived uh, idea of what was happening to me at all. So I went along and did the hands-on healing for the first two sessions that I went. And we had a nice chat about various things. Then I went the third time and I'm sitting on this kind of medical type bench in her front room uh, near a, a place called Brighton on the South coast of England. And suddenly I felt like a spider's web on my face. And again, I now realize that what that was, it was an electromagnetic field. And uh, it, what she was saying in her book is that when um, other levels, other realities are trying to lock in, into you, you sometimes feel like a spider's web on your face. And it, it's this electromagnetic connection that, that, it, that is used for this communication. So um, I'm sitting there, and she's working on my left knee, just off my left knee, and I'm thinking, I read this in her book, because <laughs> it was very, very, very obvious. There was a like a spider's web on my face, or uh, what felt like it. But Ten to fifteen seconds later, she's launched her head back and gone, "My God, this is powerful! I've got to close my eyes for this one." And then she starts to tell me that she's being told by a, a figure that can, she can see in her mind, obviously just a projection, just a symbol, uh, that I, I was going to go out on the world stage and reveal great secrets. Now, I'm, I'm presenting the sport for the BBC, and it's like, I'm going to do what? And uh, a series of things that all have come true. And the, the next week I went back, the last time I went, the fourth time, and other things were said, which have all come true. And one of the things that <clears throat> was said is that, quote, they were going to lead me to knowledge and guide me to knowledge. And on other occasions, uh, occasions, they would put knowledge directly in my mind. And I'd think, where did that come from? Well, all I can say is that um, from the moment I left her front room that day, it started. And uh, the first kind of two years, 1990, 91, maybe into 92, um, I would be guided to, and, and so, so synchronistically, I would walk into people, documents, books, personal experiences, et cetera, that were, were like handing me pieces in a puzzle. And that, at that level, at that time, all the pieces in the puzzle were the world's not controlled by who appears to be controlling it, and 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 well, so who is that kind of thing? Um, and what I would do in those first two years or so is that I would uh, look at the information that was coming to me synchronistically, and, and I would decide what I concluded about it. And then after that, uh, which has gone on to this present day, uh, it was uh, the other way round. I would know what was going on. Uh, sort of intuitively, and then the names, dates, places, tangible uh, evidence, uh, the five sense evidence would would start flowing to me. And th there was this sequence where, which has continued to the present day, where 
I will um, have a, a subject coming into my life, you know, for the first time, kind of out of nowhere. And from that moment, information about that subject is coming at me from all angles. And what it's done has taken me from, if you like, the world of the five senses and how it's controlled, how it's manipulated, the networks that are doing it. It took me then from about the mid-1990s into the fact that there's a non-human force behind this that operates outside of human sight, which is almost everything that exists is outside human sight. Um, and then it took me into uh, the simulation. And, and, and more recently, as I talk about in a, a new book called The Reveal, uh, it's taken me into um, the, the afterlife and uh, what uh, people like Isabella Green call the trap. Um, in fact, the first book in um, a, a, a trilogy about this, um, the reveal is the latest one, the middle one is the dream. The first one is actually called the trap. And I had not come across Isabella's um, information at that time. Uh, and the um, the world or the reality that um, I've I've seen as a result of this sequence makes complete sense of the world that we live in, uh, for me anyway, because, you know, I, I've i traveled around the world a lot. I can't travel so much now. I'm banned from nearly 30 European countries and Australia, what have you, that would be something I've said. And, uh, but I did uh, for a long time. And what I saw was people, to say the least, not having a good time. They were struggling to survive another day. Um, uh, the, the, the lives they lived were incredibly challenging and, and um, often uh, uh, deeply unpleasant. And the kids were coming into the world and, and, and their childhoods were, were, were um, the same. And all they had to look forward to was more of the same. And I, when I was looking at this, I, by this time, I was absolutely convinced that reincarnation is true and real, a reincarnation of consciousness. And I thought, um, why would anyone come back here? Why would they? You know, I, I, I saw, you know, the, the various... Uh, ideas that you come back to learn lessons and evolve, um, something I don't accept. Uh, and, uh, I mean, what, what are people in Gaza currently learning lessons about? And you see all this stuff around the world, and you go, well, learning lessons, right? What? How? To what end? And this is when information started to come to me in this synchronistic way uh, that, um, first of all, that this level that we call the human world is a simulation, but then uh, that what we call the afterlife or that level of the afterlife, because we're in infinite eternal um, awareness, is also another level of the simulation. And that this so-called wheel of samsara, as the Buddhists talk about, is actually the recycling of souls, quote, souls, consciousness, um, in and out of the simulation. And um, to what end? Well, we can get into that because there is an, an end, I would say, and there is a reason uh, for that. And it's nothing to do with um, evolution. So I... Um, First of all, just after the millennium, I had this overwhelming feeling out of nowhere that this reality is a simulation, the equivalent of a immensely advanced virtual reality game. And I looked around and I was looking for people who were publicly talking about this. Uh, and had the idea that, that this was a, a possibility. And the only person I found was a guy called Nick Bostrom at Oxford University, who was talking about the, 
he believed there was a great possibility that this was a simulation. He saw it in very different terms to, to the way I do, but at least he was he was talking about the same theme. And apart from that, there was very little. But what's happened since, of course, is that um, more and more mainstream scientists, there's one in the paper uh, in the UK today, um, who are talking about the fact that it does look like it's some kind of simulated reality. And what I found is if you go down that road, a lot, if not all, of the mysteries of reality and, and the world would start to disperse because they suddenly start to make sense. For instance, what I got um, in this intuitive um, download, whatever, it, just after the millennium, is that this is a simulation and the speed of light is the, the limit of the simulation, what I would now say limit of the simulation at this level. And uh, in April 2021, I remember there was an article in Scientific American where an academic had concluded that this is a simulation and that um, the limit of it, uh, he didn't say at this level, he, but there are other levels to it, actually, um, was the speed of light. And he related the speed of light to like um, the... Uh, the 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 computer speed the, the 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 speed of processing the processing speed and that was the limit and that's that's why the speed of light appears to be the fastest speed when actually beyond that it's it's actually pedestrian and so i um i then saw more and more, more of these uh, mainstream scientists saying the the same thing basically there was a guy called rich Turrill who was in the computer department at nasa who concluded publicly around 2016, 2017, that this is a holographic reality, exactly what I, I got just after the millennium. In fact, I was writing about that even before that. Um, and that um, it's a simulated reality. And as a result of that, it's not natural. It's not something that's just happened. Some intelligence has created it. And uh, that started to make more and more sense of what I was uh, getting in this synchronistic way from about the mid 1990s, that um, this human reality is actually manipulated by a non-human force operating outside of human sight. And what I um, have, have concluded uh, uh, more latterly is that that's what created the simulation. And uh, so, the next question I was asking, of course, is why? Why would you create a simulation? And I, from many and various sources came this theme, which is that these entities, which are actually representative of a very distorted, um, chaotic, psychopathic consciousness, um, were feeding off low vibrational human emotion and thought because it's mainstream science that when every time we feel emotion every time we think we're generating a frequency that is related to the nature of the thought and the nature of the emotion so from that point of view uh, these entities this consciousness that operates through these entities uh, has no interest in this world being joyful being happy, being loving, being peaceful. It, it wants us in um, states of emotion and thought that relate to the prime emotion of fear and, and related emotions like uh, resentment, regret, anxiety, depression, uh, and, and, and so on. And it starts to make sense of the world that we live in and why we have this um, world of such suffering, chaos, and um, despair and uh, deprivation for vast, vast numbers of people when we're told by religion that it was created by a loving God. 
And, you know, when I've, I've looked at this, you know, all these holy books, whether it's the Bible, the Quran, whatever holy book it is, um, there are some great lines in them. Like, I mean, in the Bible, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's a fantastic uh, line, and there's lots of great lines. But within the, these holy books are extraordinary contradictions of that. I mean, the Old Testament God is not a nice bloke right? in, in the way it's described. Um, and the, the, th the thing is, once you sell the idea that uh, these holy books were written by God, as you perceive God, then God can't be wrong. And if God can't be wrong, somehow you've got to square the circle of these contradictions, these great lines and these massive contradictions of the great lines. And so you get this, 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 this chaos, this perceptual chaos, and you get uh, priests and imams and all these people desperately trying to explain why what's happening in the world is God's will. Uh, but if you um, seek control of your own mind, your own uniqueness, your own um, perception, then what you do is you take a step back from this and you take the good lines and you leave the rest. Uh, but if you don't, then somehow you have to, you have to, explain how someone you say is a loving God has created what we see in the world today. And, and indeed, not just today, Jeff, but right the way through what we call human history. Um, and the simulation uh, created to entrap perception, that's what it, it's all about, entrap perception, entrap a sense of reality, uh, to generate events and responses to those events by incarnate awareness to generate this low vibrational emotion it all starts to make sense uh, in in a way that is is not making sense when you think a loving god has created this mayhem is it possible that we're just a prison here on the edge of the galaxy what i found interesting uh, jeff uh, when i've researched this is uh, all right you know you look around and you see enormous uh, differences in what different people believe different religions believe and, and their rituals and everything. But what I'm looking for are the areas of agreement where uh, the themes, despite all the differences, are basically the same. And what I found um, is a, a tremendous uh, common theme among religions but also ancient cultures. I mean, I've talked to shamans around the world, like Credo Mutwa, spent in, in uh, the um, South African Zulu uh, community. Uh, I spent hours and hours, days and days with him, going through uh, the, the Zulu legends and, and accounts. And you look at the Gnostic uh, Nagamadi texts, you look at the Christian belief system and the Islamic belief system, and you find these uh, common themes that relate to a non-human force operating in the hidden, manipulating human society, a negative force, actually a psychopathic force. Um, and so there are two uh, uh, levels of this, I would suggest. There's the consciousness that um, is driving the behavior of entities that are manipulating human society, and there's the entities themselves. So in Christianity, the consciousness is described as the devil or Satan, and the, uh, the entities are described as demons. In Islam, the consciousness is described as shaitan or iblis, and the jinn are the entities. In the Gnostic belief system, the consciousness is described as Yodabaoth or the demiurge, 
And as you rightly say, um, the entities uh, in the Gnostic belief system are called archons, Greek for rulers. And I've found this in um, ancient uh, societies that, that have passed that knowledge through to present day. And this, the theme is the same. So I think we're looking at two things. We're looking at this state of inverted chaotic consciousness which is operating through different levels of form. For instance, you know, if you are operating outside of the human world in, in what's called the astral, then you, you are in a more, not as much as people would believe, I would suggest, but you're in a more ethereal uh, frequency state than you are in the dense frequency state of, uh, of human. But you're still in a, in a, in a form, you're still in a, a sense of being an entity. And that behavior that you then um, exhibit is dictated by your state of consciousness. And this, um, this Yoda Bayoff consciousness, as the Gnostics would call it, is seeking to um, infiltrate and manipulate the consciousness, thus the behavior, of all these different entities on all these different levels of the simulation, not least the human one. And um, so what we call um, psychopaths, and this, uh, this consciousness is deeply psychopathic, uh, they um, are seeking to infiltrate the human mind, the human consciousness, so we become it. And if you look at um, the traits of a psychopath, the top two are having no ability to have empathy for those that suffer the consequences of their actions. And I call empathy the fail-safe mechanism of human behavior. Um, and, and if you don't have empathy, then anything goes because you have no emotional consequence for whatever you do. And the other thing that um, is missing with a psychopath is compassion. And when, when I then uh, looked at this network that I call the global cult that manipulates this network of global secret societies that operates like a web, uh, what I see exhibited by the people running that are exactly that. Uh, you cannot do what they do um, and impose upon the world what they impose if you have empathy. You can't do it if you have compassion. And, uh, you know, it's like if I, uh, if I program something into this computer and I press enter, it will not have an emotional response that says, but what's the impact on others of, of, of me doing this? It will just do it. And, and in that way, the, uh, what we call the, the, the archons, these entities, are very computer-like, very AI-like, in the sense that they, um, they operate almost as a machine, as a system, rather than uh, an entity with, uh, with compassion, with empathy, and uh, with any kind of emotional morality. Is it possible that we are just one big farm of negative emotion for these beings and we look at them as like psychopaths but if the cows out there had some sort of communication with themselves they would look at us the farmers as psychopaths well exactly um and you can relate that dynamic between humans and, and uh, uh farm animals if you like uh with the dynamic of these entities this consciousness and and the human population uh and i think that this simulation is just that i'm sure there are many other reasons for it but this is a prime reason it is a uh, a louche farm and uh, of course you'll know that um robert monroe who very much popularized uh astral projection, astral traveling, um, came up with this term of louche because he said he learned um, in his astral travels that there were entities feeding off human low vibrational emotion and thought, 
and he gave the name to it Louche. And I think this is a Louche farm. And interestingly, um, he was involved uh, with a CIA operation um, called Gateway, uh, which brought together other people that had this ability to astrally project. I mean, you've talked to many of them. I saw an interview you did the other day with, with someone who could do that. And um, to see what, what, what they were experiencing, what they saw. And um, they saw so many reptilian type entities in this astral projection that the Gateway Project gave them the, the name the, the Alligators. And of course, I became infamous in the mid '90s for saying that uh, these entities manipulating human society, certainly in in large number, not totally anything like totally, but in large number, took a reptilian form. And um, so, you know, as I've moved through the through the gears, through the the levels of um, awareness, uh, it's it's made sense of why the world is as it is. And the other thing that I've obviously asked about um, is, okay, what the heck is this simulation? What is it? What form does it take? And if you fuse together the, the esoteric, the far out, if you like, not really far out, but um, and you fuse it together with the, the 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 scientific as we perceive science. There are many many areas that actually come together. Um, for me, for instance, we are in a simulation that is not a construct; it's a information source, and. We are decoding that information source into a sense of reality. And what's decoding it is this, the human body. I've been calling the, the human body since the 1990s a biological computer. Instinctively, I, I, that, that, that term was coming to me. It's a biological computer. And what, I, what is also interesting in terms of the biological is that we perceive the technological to be technological, machinery, whatever, and we perceive the biological to be natural. My question is, how do we know that? How do we know that um, the biological is not a very advanced form of technological? And I do know, having researched this for 35 years now, that this cult, they look upon the biological as a, a form of technology, a form of computer system. And what I'm saying in the books is that the simulation is like a Wi-Fi field. It's like a, a, a radiation field of information. Um, we are basically the computer that is decoding that information into a sense of external reality, which is actually going on in here. So if you look at mainstream science, you know, they talk about the five senses. Uh, the, the five senses are how we lock into this simulated information uh, source. The five senses are picking up vibrational information. Uh, the ears are a classic with sound waves, but they're picking up um, this uh, vibrational frequency information. They then turn it into electrical information, same information, different form, which they then communicate to the brain. And the brain, I say, um, decodes it into a digital holographic um, state, which we perceive to be outside of ourselves, but it's actually happening in here. And it's um, very much more, very much easier now to describe these things because we have the analogies. This whole technological explosion that's going on of AI and computerization, all of it, Wi-Fi, um, means that we can 
uh, have the analogies to describe what we're talking about, because what I've seen over the years, Jeff, is that this technological explosion is technologically uh, mirroring, mimicking the way that we are interacting with this simulated reality. And, and so you have um, the, 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 the body, which is um, constantly uh, decoding the simulation and delivering to us a sense of reality. And if you then um, liken that to the computers that we know about and the Wi-Fi we know about, what is happening is if there was Wi-Fi in this room, I think there is in this hotel room, um, you would um, uh, look around and you'd say, where is it? Where is it? You can't see it because it's operating on a frequency that we can't perceive. But the computer can lock into that Wi-Fi field and it can turn information in that radiation form and it can put it on the screen in a totally different way. Because if you said to people, okay, uh, tell me about the internet, they would say, okay, well, it's, it's moving pictures and it's graphics and it's words and it's all this stuff. And yes, it is. But the only place the internet exists in that form is on the screen. Everywhere else, it's electronic circuits and Wi-Fi fields. And when you uh, sit here now and I'm looking at the screen, um, where is that decoding taking place? It's not taking place here or here. It's taking place inside the computer. And in that way, I'm saying that it absolutely mirrors the way that we are decoding this simulation into a, uh, a a form that appears to be outside of us. I'll grant you that. It does seem like that, but it's actually um, in here. And so when you um, go on the internet and you look at these video compilations of people that put headsets on uh, in virtual reality games, and they, they might be in an empty room or there might be someone filming or whatever with them. But when they put the headset on, you'll see that their perception of reality is transformed virtually instantly. They're screaming, they're shouting, they're falling off their chair, they're running away. And all they've done is put a headset on. And what has the headset done? What do the gloves do in the more sophisticated virtual reality games and the, and the audio? They are tapping into the same five senses, I say anyway, through which we are decoding the uh, simulation. And they override those um, senses into a, with a completely different reality. Now, with a headset, and I say this, this what we call the human body is the equivalent to a, to a headset. More, <laughs> seriously, more advanced, mate. Um, when you have a headset on, you can go like that and go, whoosh, ha, ha, ha just a game. But when the headset is your body, which is delivering this reality to you by decoding the simulation field, you can only um, take the headset off when you, quote, die. And, you know, this is, for me, what, it, what death is. It, it's simply a transfer of attention. That's all it is. Because we are consciousness. The, we are what is experiencing the world. This is the vehicle for that experience. So when the body ceases to function, quote, dies, it ceases to decode the simulation. And as it ceases to do that, your consciousness is no longer being delivered this sense of reality and it's an interactive reality, it's affecting us, but we can affect it. It's, it's suddenly in this um, situation that you, um, you have uh, heard described so many times in your shows, where people are, uh, or consciousness, is in a completely different reality. And for me, the, all that's happened is that the decoding of this level of the simulation has, uh, has, has ceased to happen, and it's freed consciousness to, to be in another reality. And that other reality uh, is 
what we immediately call the, the afterlife um, or the spirit world. And I say that's another level of the simulation. Um, and, and what I'm not saying is everything is a simulation. I'm saying this simulated reality, different levels of it, is actually tiny, uh, like a like a end of a pin compared with infinite reality. But the idea of this, this trap is to entrap consciousness so that it leaves the body when the body expires, goes through this wheel of samsara and comes back in in another form to continue the loose production. Um, and so when people or consciousness leaves the body and, and what I say takes on the, the soul level of uh, perception, uh, it's just another level of the of the simulation. And uh, if you if you move to uh, a, a higher level of awareness that I call spirit, then that's out of here. But for me, what we call the soul and what we call the human body are two vehicles for the different levels of the simulation. Have you discovered a way to manipulate the simulation for your own benefit? Well, I think um, we can do this when we become conscious beyond the program. And here's another uh, conclusion I've come to from my research over the years. You know, I, I listen to all these um, near-death accounts and, um, and, and people who've experienced the, the afterlife when the bodies die and then they've returned. And I've also um, seen the accounts of people um, far fewer in number, but the common themes are compelling, who can remember the between life state and they can remember the, the incarnation process. I mean, I've seen people describe it on, on your shows. Um, and funnily enough, uh, a lot of them are describing this incarnation process in, 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 in pretty um, technological, terms but they're also talking about okay so this is the life that is most beneficial for your evolution because you've got to go back in to evolve and all that stuff that that we hear and it's the accounts often describe this preparation for the next incarnation in very fine detail you know do you want this hair or that hair or do you want this or do you want that and all the rest of it um, and so the question then is how do they do that and this is my, my my feeling anyway that the body in each incarnation contains a uh, a life program it's like a software program in the biological computer and if you only follow the program, you don't open to your more expansive consciousness, but you just follow the program, then basically people are like non-player characters in a computer game. They're not playing the game anymore. The game's playing them. They're just an extension of the game. And so when you um, uh, are, are just following the program, there are two types of synchronicity, for me anyway. There's the synchronicity that appears to be synchronicity because your program is interacting with other programs and creating interaction and relationships as the program is designed, not least, of course, uh, often uh, as much loose as possible. And then there's the consciousness synchronicity where you, your consciousness is attracting uh, people into your life and you into other people's lives. And... Um, so I would say that uh, if you want to uh, take control of your life, you have to become conscious beyond the program. And if I look at the way that the manipulation of the human world works, um, whether it's the so-called education system or the media or all these forms of communication, which are perception manipulators, um, they're all trying to 
uh, get you to either self-identify with being uh, a human and the labels of a human life, or if you won't buy that, life's a bitch and then you die, then it's to get you to believe that there's some uh, judgmental God that you should be frightened of that loves you. Uh, and the the two are um, are, are prisons. They're, they're prisons of limitation, of perceptual limitation, of consciousness limitation. When you um, self-identify the I with the labels of a human life, man, woman, uh, sexuality, race, uh, uh, religion, whatever, you are self-identifying with myopia. You're self-identifying with limitation. That's where they want you. They want you in a myopic state of sense of reality and sense of self-identity. The other one is that uh, you're subordinate and uh, under the control of some some God, some loving God, and, and you've got to be frightened of how God will judge you and all that stuff. And again, that's a sense of limitation. You know, it's like the human race has got to stop looking up and start looking the world in the eye. Start realizing that the self-identity that we've been given, either as a, a human or a subordinate soul, is not who we are. They're what we experience in the simulation, but they're not who we are. What we are is a, uh, an infinite state of awareness. We are simply beyond form, a state of being aware, what I call spirit, the, the, the sense of, of, of spirit, just a word, but it, it's uh, a way of uh, expressing the difference between the soul and the, the human. And when we um, ask the question, you know, how do we get out of here? Then for me, when I've, I've looked at the different explanations, it can, it can sound terribly complicated that you, you basically spend your whole life uh, doing things and whatever, going on quests and drinking green tea, whatever, to, um, to reach this state of enlightenment when actually to, 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 to break out of the wheel of samsara, as this would say, when actually I think it's all about, about self-identity. It's, it really is as simple as that. For me, all genius is to see the simple hidden by the complex, the apparently complex. And given that, you know, we live in an infinite reality that is the ultimate genius, then answers tend to be simple rather than complex. What you have is all these scientists and academics, and they're, they're looking at the complex. If it's not complex, it can't be real. The, or the answer's not complex, it can't be an answer. When actually it's, it's, it's really simple, in my view anyway. So if you um, are in a human body and you're self-identifying with the human body and the labels of it, you are self-identifying with limitation. I can't, it's not possible. And I was therefore, because I'm just a little me, I have no power, I've got to look up to experts to tell me what to think. And what I found interesting, um, Jeff, listening to near-death experience accounts, is how that dynamic transfers itself into the astral, where um, consciousness souls leave the body, and then they're, they're faced with other authority figures. They may be religious heroes, they may be uh, spirit guides or elders or, or whatever, but they're a form of authority. And the perception is that that authority knows more than you do. So basically people follow the authority and the guidance of the authority. And it, it's in that way, although the, the frequencies are different and um, the astral is far less dense, or most of it anyway, than the, um, the human world, incredibly dense, um, the dynamic it, it tends to be the same. And so you've got this self-identity of human and limitation 
And that self-identity, for me, expresses itself in the frequency you're operating on. So if you think you're little me and have no power, you are operating on a very low level of frequency compared with what you could be. And because of your myopia, your myopia of self-identity, you are accessing a comparable amount of the infinite field of awareness. And therefore, um, your limited self-identity becomes your limited uh, perception of everything. When you go into the uh, um, the astral as a, quote, uh, soul, then obviously your self-identity is expanded, but you're still perceiving yourself as uh, an entity, an I, which uh, I say is the false I, just like the human is the false I. But when you, um, you self-identify as being a unique expression of all that is, has been, and ever can be, a unique expression of um, infinite awareness that is beyond form, that is beyond all of it, that's when you are not even, in the end, um, generating a frequency. It's when you move beyond frequency into an infinite state. And that um, cannot be held. That, that frequency state that comes from that self-identity cannot be held in the simulation, in the matrix. Uh, and, you know, it, it, it's interesting that the Buddhists talk about the wheel of samsara and how you have to keep um, experiencing lives in this human reality to reach a state of enlightenment that you can escape the wheel. There's another esoteric um, concept that goes under the, 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 the name of the ring pass knot, which says that there is a level of frequency in effect beyond which you cannot go unless you've reached a state basically of enlightenment that you can go through it. And this is, uh, for me, uh, the difference between uh, being caught and trapped in this matrix simulation and escaping from it, not even escaping from it, just it's, I'm off now, bye, see ya, you're out. Because it cannot entrap you when you're in um, a state of awareness, a state of self-identity that's beyond the frequency walls of this simulation. Uh, and if you then um, play this off against the all the stuff that I do about the the global cult manipulating global society, moving towards dystopia and all that stuff within the human world, and you see the uh, the the impact of religions, the impact of uh, society in general, uh, the institutions of society, they are all having the effect of making you see yourself in limited terms where you're just a, a human, that's all I am, or I'm a soul that's subordinate to God, that's all I am, that's what I am. And it's all about holding your perception and your self-identity in a state that's not going to uh, escape this simulation. And uh, so for me, um, if we want to impose ourselves on the simulation and, and stop being subordinate to its dictats, and its impulses, then um, we've got to um, realize our true nature and become not as a concept, but as a being, and and live that um, live that life while in a human body. That we are consciousness. We are having a human experience. It's not who we are, and. Um, like I say, the, the whole pressure of society, whether it's religion or whatever, is to hold you in a state of self-identity that dictates your frequency, which holds you in the frequency walls of this, um, of this simulation. Um, so the wheel of samsara continues.
Do you have some sort of practice of meditation where you try to go to somewhere like the void and become one with this unified field? Well, it's it's a, a, a interesting question because um, when would it be? Around the early 2000s, I was writing books about the, the conspiracy, the human conspiracy and all that stuff, and, but, but also, you know, reality. And I concluded that um, if I was going to understand more, I had to uh, experience these other realities, um, not just as uh, uh, a, um, a concept but, uh, or as a dream, but I had to um, consciously experience them. And just as I was coming to that conclusion, I got uh, contacted by a group who um, were putting on a week where people were taking ayahuasca in a Brazilian rainforest. It's the only time that I've taken psychoactive drugs ever. So I went there, and I could have taken it four times. I took it, um, took it twice, um, and that was enough for me because of what I got. And uh, I had an extraordinary experience where for five hours on the second occasion, a voice as loud as mine is now, took a female form, was talking to me about the illusory nature of human reality. And it was hilarious. It was very, very funny. I mean, they've got a sense of humor out there, I'll tell you. Um, and what happened is I was kind of transported, my mind went to this, this void. Um, but it wasn't a void. Um, you know, when you're talking about infinity and the infinity of possibility, then all things must be possible. So we tend to think in human terms as either or. It either is or it isn't. It's everything or it's nothing. But within the realm of infinite possibility, all possibility is possible. And so within that uh, void, you kind of experienced everything and nothing. It was and it wasn't. All It was all possibility just waiting to manifest. And I was um, fascinated many years later because what it, it took the, the, the form, it was, it was black, but it was brilliant. It's very difficult to describe. Many people watching this show will have experienced it, I'm sure. It was like a brilliant blackness, but it was everything. And this voice said to me, this is where you've come from and to where you will return. And a few years later, um, a lot of publicity uh, surrounded the, the book of Eben Alexander. And um, I read his book about his um, near-death experience. And he said that he basically experienced this void. And, and I, I, I read the words. He said he called it the dazzling darkness. And I thought, my goodness me, that is exactly what I experienced in 2003. And the voice went on to, to explain that the world that we think of physicality and um, external reality is actually an, an illusion, and that um, we are the consciousness having the experience. But what's happened, of course, and this is all part of the manipulation of the, the, the simulation, is to trick us into believing that what we're experiencing is who we are. And after that, um, so you identify with fake identity. Oh, I'm the body, I'm a human. No, that's an experience. The labels of a human life are experiences. They're not uh, an I in the eternal sense. And so, uh, when I was um, 
when I was through with that and, and I'd experienced that, and I got so much uh, knowledge from that experience of five hours. And, and also, I had instant recall of, of, of it as well. I didn't write it down or anything, but I, I could remember it all. Uh, but from that moment, um, I've what what I've what I've experienced, Jeff, uh, since uh, the top of my head blew off in um, 1990. That's another that's another story on a, a mound in Peru. Um, is that um, you know I'm uh, I, I am a a, a, a a state of awareness, and I'm. Uh, experiencing this reality but i'm not actually um this reality and it's uh taking a step back into consciousness where you're in this world but you're not of it it's where you become the observer far more than the participant it doesn't mean you don't interact with the world you do but you do it from a different um, perspective. It's like, you know, when you have um, a dream and you think it's real, then you're emotionally affected by it. You can wake up in a sweat in the middle of the night and think, oh, my God, about a nightmare. But there's another kind of dream, lucid dreams, they call them, where you know it's a dream. And you observe the dream. And because you're observing the dream, knowing it's a dream, you're not impacted emotionally and mentally and, and what have you by the dream as you would normally be. And, you know, this simulation is basically an induced dream. Uh, years ago, when I was a journalist, a uh, mainstream journalist, I would um, wake up in the morning and I'd put the radio on to see what the latest news was. And I'd often fall asleep, which for what seemed like ages, but only was a few minutes. And, and often I would have a dream, a really vivid dream. And when I woke up, the dream I was having related to the story being broadcast on the radio. So that was an induced dream by the information coming on the radio. And what this simulation is, is inducing a dream by delivering this sense of reality through the biological computer. Um, that um, gets us to believe that we're experiencing a reality that's nothing like what we're actually um, experiencing. And so the way I've dealt with it um, uh, since that, particularly since that ayahuasca experience, is not to, you know, go into these, um, th these projections. Uh, if they happen naturally, fantastic. Um, but to uh, take this step back and observe the dream, knowing it's a dream. And it's a completely different way of living your life, completely different way of interacting with, with the world. And, and once you take this step back into a, a, the self-identity that, that we are a, a state of awareness, and this is just a, a, a dream that we're experiencing, you start to see how the dots connect that you can't see in that myopic state. And the other thing that's happened, I was going to mention um, after my head blowing experience in Peru, is that from that moment, um, I've had uh, constantly, all these now 35 years, coma sleeps, real coma sleeps. Um, funny enough, often during the day, where I'll be you know, working or whatever, and suddenly I'll become incredibly tired very quickly. And I'll go and sleep, and I go into these coma sleeps, real coma sleeps. Um, and often when I, you know, you you kind of wake up and you kind of realize that you're back in the world, it can be half an hour before I can actually move. And when I come back, um, I kind of instinctively know that I know something that I didn't know before. And then gradually over the, you know, as the days follow, you you start to get insights. Insights start to come to you. And um, so that's um, that's something that's happened to me since 1990. And I think um, I'm probably traveling uh, distant places when I'm in those coma sleeps that um, I do not have a visual awareness of.
Do you have any other tips, practical tips that we can use to help us free our minds from the matrix? Well, you know, I keep coming back to this, this theme of self-identity. For me, that is everything. And, you know, I, I've had this confirmed so many times by the fact that this, this global cult in its various forms is always trying to control your self-identity. It's always trying to put you in a state of fear, which is a low vibrational state, which suits the whole shebang of the game. And if you self-identify with um, just being a human, then you're in a low frequency state. And the, <coughs> excuse me, the, um, what I call the AI body program, uh, the AI astral body program, the, the, the program that's, that's, controlling your life unless you become conscious beyond it. Um, that will um, go on calling the shots and you'll be having thoughts which you perceive to be yours, but are actually coming from the program. That's why, you know, when you look around the world and you look at the infinity of possibility, uh, how people tend to react the same. It's unbelievable. It's like pressing enter on a computer. You know, if you do this, people are going to react in that way overwhelmingly. And that's the program. And, you know, when you, um, you, you kind of take just a, a, a step back and you listen to your own thoughts and, and, and you, what, you can get to that state where you're observing your own thoughts and they're, and, and they're, they're going. It's, it's what we call the mind chatter. Oh, she says this to me, I'll say this to her. And I said that, and I would have done that woman in 1963, and I'll do this if they do that. It's all going through. But you can get to that point where you're observing it. And so then you ask the question, what's observed? Well, consciousness is observing it. So what is it? It's the program. It's the program running through. But you can take a step back from it. And you can observe the program, realizing it's a program. And through this self-identity with being pure spirit, pure consciousness, an infinite state of all possibility, um, and, and living it, living your life from that perspective, you um, become an observer of the game, and the game loses its power over you, just in the same way that when you're observing a dream, the dream does not have power over you. When you're in the dream and of the dream, it has power over you. And so it's this, it's this, um, this perception of self-identity that takes you beyond all of it. And, you know, you've got the 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 mind program running through oh yum, 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 and all this stuff the mind chatter um and this is what i was talking about earlier people um then think they have to work through that i've got to work through that i've got to let this go i've got to let that go i've got to do this got to do that and then you've got to drink green tea and all that stuff but if you just become the consciousness you truly are beyond the program, there's nothing to sort out anymore because you are basically withdrawing from the program and becoming an observer of the program. And it can be hilarious, actually, when you, when you do that. And what happens, in my experience anyway, is the more you do that, you still get pulled in, and you get pulled in uh, into, the, into the program, but the more you do it, the more you immediately recognize, I've been pulled in the program, I'm out. And this roller coaster of life, you know, and drama eases out because we are all that is, has been, and ever can be. We are infinity having a brief human experience. That's as bad as it gets. And we'll always be infinity. We'll always be eternity we'll always be exploring forever forever and we're we're now experiencing something that's uh 
that's kind of entrapped our perception. So if you, if the problem is entrapped perception, then the answer must be untrapped perception, which means you step back out of the program that's controlling perception and into the consciousness that you are that can observe the program and see it for what it is, that can observe the dream and see it for what it is. And um, this, for me, is uh, the way that uh, we can um, escape the drama. Because, you know, if you think about it, it's the drama that basically pulling you in to the matrix, into the simulation. It's all about drama. And, and you know, the alternative media um, also has to be very aware that it's not playing a part in the same drama. So you turn on the news, drama. Oh, this does a oh, my God. Oh, my, have you heard the latest? What's happening? Oh, my God. And then you, you'll turn on the alternative media. Oh, my God, have you heard what's happening? It's, it's, and, and the drama pulls you in. Oh, my God, oh, my God. What happens when you take this step back and hold this state of consciousness and become an observer? It doesn't mean you don't do anything, but you, 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 you are in a state of observation. Uh, the dramas kind of balance out. You don't get pulled into them like you did before. You realize that some things matter, but most things don't because um, things that wind you up and get you to react to the drama, oh my God, in another hour or another day or another week, you'll say to people, well, what happened about that? You, you were terribly upset the last time I saw you. Oh no, that's been sorted out now, all right. Okay, so you went through all that. For what? Because you got pulled into the drama. And the trick is holding this observation state so that you can see what matters and what doesn't. And most things don't because they'll get resolved. Do you think the program knows what triggers you and it realizes that you are trying to push back or push away and it pulls you back in? Exactly. Um, and uh, it's very, the program and, and that which manipulates the program is very skilled at manipulating perception and of predicting that stimulus A will get reaction B. It's brilliant at that. Because this, this consciousness that I talk about, that's um, basically this inverted consciousness that's behind all that. And by the way, I keep saying inverted consciousness. Look at the world. It's inverted. Everything's upside down um, because this inverted consciousness is 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 behind it. Uh, but it's not all powerful. This is the thing that I always try to get across. This consciousness is not all powerful. We're not subordinate to it unless our perception persuades us that we are. It's stupid. I mean, this Yolda Bayoff that um, the Gnostics talked about, and, and, and not just the Gnostics, but, but other names in other cultures, um, they describe it as the foolish god. It's basically uh, moronic because you don't want to do what it wants to do, and it does, unless you are um, moronic. Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to control people and cause suffering and all that stuff? So it's not all powerful. It's not. Um, I'll come to the, the dynamic in a second that, that it operates on. But it is brilliant at manipulating perception and predicting where perception will lead. And so all the time in what we call organic, random world events, it's making, oh, it's making things happen to, um, to the end of knowing how people will react. It, for instance, I'll give you a quick, quick example. I coined a phrase in the 1990s, problem, reaction, solution, where um, you covertly create a problem. It uh, could be a, a, a banking crash. It could be a war. It could be anything. Um, and you tell the public the version of the problem that you want them to believe. 
And, and even though you have covertly created it, you don't want them to know that, obviously. So you give them a, a cover story for why it's happened. And you want the reaction, emotional reaction, at, at, at point number two of do something. Uh, something must be done. And then you, who've um, manipulated covertly the problem and got that reaction, then openly, through legislation, whatever, and changes in the law, um, impose the solution to what you've covertly created. Now, that uh, problem, reaction, solution uh, uh, scenario, which is played on us daily, all the time, is the manipulation of perception, the manipulation of um, emotion and manipulation of perception. So all this is going on um, all the time, and this is where it's, it's absolutely uh, brilliant. But... This consciousness and these entities, I've picked this up so many times over the years, are in a state of um, enormous insecurity because their whole game depends on continuing to control human perception, thus behavior, and to make us respond in ways that produce the, the, the louche and if we stop doing that by awakening to the true nature of the I, then the game's over. So um, this is why this force, whatever you want to call it, is, is so constantly insecure and terrified of human awakening. To this point, it, if you had a football match, it wouldn't be um, uh, it wouldn't be happy. It certainly wouldn't be secure by controlling one side, because there is an unknown possibility outcome, which is the other side that you don't control. To um, to this consciousness and its uh, entities, um, to um, to have states of flux where the outcome is not callable is their worst nightmare. So in the football analogy, they would want to control both sides and the referee so they knew before the game started what the result was going to be. Um, they're always trying to control both sides in every debate, every um, situation, so that they know they can call um, the outcome they put their they put their people in those that are pushing for what they want and they put their people in that which appears to be pushing back against what they want so they control the outcome and um so what i'm talking about here uh, with this redefinition of self identity um it takes um it takes the game away from, from this. It takes the game away from them. Because when you move out of the program and into your unique consciousness, because, you know, we're all aspects of the same one consciousness, but we're all unique aspects. We're not globs. We're all unique aspects. And when you, you take um, back your uniqueness and you take back your uniqueness of perception and your uniqueness of sense of possibility, what you're taking away is the uniformity of the program. And if you look at every tyranny, don't matter if you call it communist or fascist, it doesn't matter what you call it, the same dynamic is there. They want centralization of power, so a few can control everyone else, and they want a uniformity a uniformity of society, even down, if you look at the old Soviet Union, into a uniformity of even buildings. And we're getting that uniformity of buildings around the world anyway, um, as, as we, we, we move on. And that unity uh, or uniformity means it can be centrally controlled. And when there's a few and you want to control is control because the more diversity of control and power you have the less any central entity can dictate from the center so as you 
redefine your self-identity and you become your uniqueness of self and you withdraw from these group thinks of religions and 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 uh political parties political uh, persuasions whatever you you withdraw from them uh that uh expansion of uh, of uniqueness is withdrawing from the uniformity uh to the point where you don't know what you're going to do next so how can anyone else know and that's the process that will take us um away from this uh, program this program society where um we celebrate uniqueness instead of scorning it and again that's another aspect of this if you look at how people react and i know this from my experience in the early 1990s when i couldn't walk down any street in britain without being laughed at um the reaction of the group think the sense of normal um, means that anyone who is perceived to be outside the normal is either ridiculed um, as crazy or abused for being dangerous. And this is um, another aspect of this control of perception, which is control of the normal. If you can control the normal, you control society basically, because one of the great ways of um, of control is to suppress, compress the sense of possibility. Very, very important. Possible. Then when you are manipulating uh, through, then people would just dismiss it can't be happening mate that's impossible but it's not it's just your perception of the possible it's not what's actually possible and not possible and so what we um have is two worlds uh within one world within the human world uh, one is this global cult with his network of secret societies and one is the population and the difference between the two is knowledge the idea is that you pass on advanced knowledge like the nature of reality that you talk so much about, about the, the plan for humanity and where, where humanity is being taken towards this dystopia. You pass that on through the secret society network, the inner core of it, because you want to keep it. That's why this we have secret societies. Who are they keeping secrets from? The population. And at the same time, you've created this network of passing on advanced knowledge um, isolated from the population. That same cult, this is well researchable, have created the means of communication within the population. All these forms of communication from which we form our perception are cult created. And what this has done is create this enormous division between the knowledge passed on through the secret society network and the knowledge that the public is as a normal course of events allowed to um to access and what this does with this squeezing of the sense of the possible which is what what happens with the knowledge that's uh, given to the human population is when people like me uncover what is being passed on through here and say to the population this is what they're doing that sense of the possible says you're mad mate you're crazy that's ridiculous it's not possible it's uh again we come down to this basic foundation of all this conspiracy whether it's human conspiracy or interdimensional conspiracy control of perception and we need to take control of our perceptions back and you do that by redefining your self-identity and not accepting yourself to be what they constantly tell you from cradle to grave that you are. David, due to time, I need to switch gears with you. Earlier, you mentioned that your latest book is called The Reveal, which I believe is a part of a series. If people want to find out more yeah. about it, do they go to your website or Amazon? Yeah, they can go to uh, my website. Um, and. Um, it's a trilogy, 
I mean, I've written nearly 30 books now. Um, and, you know, what we talked about earlier, Jeff, about this process of uh, this is what I, I think I know, so what don't I know? Um, it's taken me through this vast spectrum of information from the the five sense reality through the nature of reality and now into the areas that you specialize in the afterlife and um and the the the, the kind of where do we go when, when the body expires and um that's the focus that latter is the focus of these three books the trap the dream and the reveal and um they're written individually so you can read the, the book in each book and, and get from it the, the the story but there's also a progression between the uh between the three um and uh it's for me uh, it's it's it not only is it information that we talk about you talk about that affects every human being it's absolutely vital i would say that people realize these levels of the game that we're talking about. Because, you know, first of all, what reincarnation does is make, it basically mocks uh, racial self-identity. Um, you know, how many uh, slaves uh, or slave owners um, have, have come back as people who are in experiences of slavery. I mean, you know, you can say, for instance, someone like Alex Jones, there's a conspiracy, is this conspiracy, is that conspiracy. <clears throat> but through this process of reincarnation, if we don't understand the game and how we can get free of the game, then you could come back, that same consciousness could come back and be anti-conspiracy. It, it, it's, a, it's a strange thing that reincarnation kind of changes everything. It changes the whole dynamic of, 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 of human life. And for me, the idea is not to keep coming back. It's to get out of this nonsense and this... Um, entrapment this perceptual entrapment that's what that's, that's what the the simulation is it's perceptual entrapment uh and and return to infinity in full knowledge that we are infinity do you have any new things that you're working on that you want people to know about it's a constant um it's a constant to quote journey of trying to uncover more and more and more and um you know, I, 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 won't, I won't talk about it now, but I, I do have um, further concepts of how even deeper this this goes. But but this is the whole thing, Jeff, you know. It's not just about uncovering the scale of it, though that's important, because if you don't understand the scale, then you, you're going to be, you know, stomping around in a fraction of it thinking you've got it. But in understanding the scale of it and how it's done, that's where the answers lie. You know, the, the answer to mass human control, it's not any politician. Um, it's not um, anything in the world of what we perceive as physicality. It's in the realms of consciousness and taking control of consciousness back from that which is programming our sense of consciousness and reality. That's, that's where the answers lie. And if you break it all down, you know, one of the interesting things, having been through this journey of 35 years, where you, you, you're, you're dealing with these different levels of it, like the, the, the manipulation of human society and blah, 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 and uh, the banking system and politicians and, whatever, and all these others, um, is that you can um, you can see how people um, are called um, you know living in mind prisons or you you just you believe anything you're told, but then you can go oh it's not what I thought it was, but you're still in a mind prison, just a bigger one, 
An awakening is constantly expanding the mind prison until the prime prison's gone altogether. And uh, if 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 we do don't see the, the the scale and thus where the answers lie, which is in becoming conscious beyond the program, then the program will continue to recycle us and uh, get us to produce the the louche through trauma that um, this is all about. In my view, it's 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 all about. Um, and so, you know, the the shows that you and the people that you talk to are very, very um, important in this more expansive understanding of the conspiracy. It's not just about politics and banking and any of this stuff. That's the way it plays out. What it is, if you look at it, in every aspect and every facet and form, are the different ways of controlling perception. And we need to take control of that back because then the game is over because we've removed the cause of human control. David, for some people, this topic may be very disconcerting or scary. So before we wrap it up, can you give us one last positive message? Well, in the end, you know, the, the irony, Jeff, is that um, I, I'm pointing out um, how a human control is possible and, and the means through which it's done. But at the same time, I'm saying, and I've said all along, it doesn't have to happen. We are the power. How can 8 billion, if you just take the human world, how can 8 billion people be controlled by a relative handful, and it is a relative handful in full knowledge of what they're doing, unless they are having cooperation in that control by the 8 billion? It's impossible. You can't do it. And this is where perception control comes in because there's not enough of you to physically impose your will. You can do it in certain areas, but not globally. They're trying to do that through control, uh, connecting AI to the human brain, and that's another story. Um, but until that's done, or until we allow that to be done, they have to control perception um, in other ways, because without controlling perception, thus behavior, they can't control us. There's two types of perception that um, have been responsible for every tyranny in history. One is that which believes what authority tells it without question, where the program's running, which is obey authority, um, and, and is not being overridden by consciousness. Number two are those that can see there's something happening here and it's not right. And I'm not, I'm not sure you're, you're telling me the truth or I, I, I know you're not telling me the truth, but they still comply and obey because they fear the consequences of not obeying. Now, those two states of perception have been responsible for every tyranny in history. And the third one is responsible for ending every tyranny in history. And those are people that can see that they're being lied to, they can see why, and they refuse to cooperate with that which is lying to them and imposing tyranny upon them. And um, that that third mentality, that third perception is what we need to vastly increase, and it is increasing, but vastly increase more. The power of the few is always with the acquiescence of the many. Fascism and communism, as an example, tyranny, is never um, imposed by fascists and communists. There's never enough of them. The fascism, tyranny, uh, communism is imposed by the acquiescence of the population to the fascists and communists and tyrants. And we have the, the choice and, and the... Um, the opportunity all the time to do that, but control of perception, obey authority, or what are the consequences of not obeying authority, 
mean that we acquiesce to it. And this is, again, why self-identity is so important. I am all that is, has been, and ever can be having a brief human experience. Am I going to concede my uniqueness? Am I going to concede my, um, my, my, my sovereignty to, uh, uh, to an authority in this human world? Because, A, I'm not going to think for myself, even though I am an expression of all that is, or I am going to concede to fear and obey authority anyway. And from that, this perspective of observing the world, it's like, hold on, I am all that is, has been, and ever can be. I'm having a brief human experience. What happens in that brief human experience? Um, uh, what does it matter what they do to me? My, my focus is doing what I believe to be right, it's um, expressing my uniqueness of consciousness. It is not to concede, no matter what the consequences, it's not to concede that uniqueness to um, an authority that's self-appointed. And people talk about love, and it's a, a very, very important point. I think the heart's very, very important. The heart vortex is very, very important as a connection to the greater self. But for me, what, what love in its true sense does is it does what it believes to be right at any point and in any situation. And it does not think of consequences. I'm not talking about the consequences of if I walk across the road in front of a truck, I'm going to get hit. Of course, you're aware of that. And so you don't do it. But I mean, consequences for doing what you know to be right. You don't, uh, uh, I, I can talk to myself, I don't um, consider consequences. Because to consider consequences to love is to consider not doing what you believe to be right. And love would never, consciousness, expanded consciousness, wisdom, whatever you want to call it, would never consider not doing what it, it, it believed to be right. And, 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 and thus, um, if you consider consequences for doing what you believe to be right, you'll always list enough to go, I'd like to do what I believe to be right, but uh, not that badly, thank you. But true wisdom, true love, true uniqueness, will never concede what it believes to be right to fear of consequences. And if you take fear of consequences out of the human psyche, so much that we now acquiesce to would not be acquiesced to. Because fear of the consequences is what holds people so, so much in servitude. And uh, personally, I, I, I won't cooperate with that under any circumstances, no matter what the consequences. David, you were brilliant. Thank you for being my guest. Thank you very much, Jeff. Real pleasure. The pleasure was all mine. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.